Nadia, what do you like about the journey of pursuing acting versus the journey of becoming a filmmaker? Hmm, that's a really good question. Yeah, I think that um, when you're looking to be in the career as an actress, you are really dependent on a lot of other people's opinions and permission. And when you're a filmmaker, you can really initiate your own projects. You can be creative all of the time. You don't have to, you don't have to wait for someone to give you an audition or to cast you in a role. You can just go out on your own and make a film. And I definitely think that was like part of the decision um, you know, back in my mid-twenties after being an actress for like 10 years in Canada that I felt like I wanted a more kind of like full and rich experience that I was also able to not control but like to to really own and to to make, you know, my destiny mine. <laughs> right, and I want to come back to that in just a little bit but I'm just curious with The People Garden, which is the film that's just come out, right? Uh, it, it was last week that it yeah, came out? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when did you begin writing it? Because I thought it was a while ago. It is, yeah. I started getting the idea back in college and university in my last year. Um, and I did other things in between, but it's been about six years. So, yeah. So, um, like for me, it was um, the first film that I really wrote. So there's Taking Your Time and learning how to write a feature um, during the process of actually writing a feature, that's one thing. And then the other thing is that in Canada we have a funding system such that you get development money and, and that's really wonderful because you can make a living as you're making a, uh, writing a film. But it also, it takes a while, it takes a long time. So there was a lot of you know years in between kind of that initial idea and just, you know, of me just doing other things, whether it be acting or other film work or uh, directing or whatever. But so, you know, you're writing and making it and shaping it for now it's been about, yeah, six years. Yeah. Six years. Wow. Yeah. Do you remember <laughs> like the day whether you were in class or, or was there a spark where you said, OK, I need to really do this. This is what I want to do. No, it's. I can't remember that far back as to like exactly what, what it was, but it, there was a combination of being immersed. I, I did a film theory um, degree at university and you're, so that's meaning like it's not a practical, it's a, it's, you're studying film, it's an academic program. So you're writing about films and you're watching films and you're critiquing them. And you know, I was very immersed in this auteur cinema and the great auteurs are often men and when you're female and you want to have you have aspirations of being a director it becomes really frust frustrating because on one hand like i was you know loving the worlds that were created by people like david lynch or vim vendors or jim jeremush or you know whatever those people are like you know my heroes in a way but they also do kind of male driven films and i wanted someone like me that i could kind of um, connect with and I remember seeing this film called Morvin Collar by Lynn Ramsey right around the same time that I saw The Virgin Suicides by Sofia Coppola and suddenly those were like two films that had females in the lead and they had females that were directing it and and I started to think like you know it was possible to kind of make this kind of cinema that I wanted to make um, and so then I started writing and that's where the idea kind of started and then there was another side to it, which was that I was in a Japanese um, cinema and literature class as part of my studies, and we were studying this this kind of very dark and very strange uh, book called The Complete Manual to Suicide, and that's where I read about the forest. So everything was kind of just happening and percolating in my mind, and I just started, you know, writing and um, developing and really working on this character, Sweet Pea, more than anything. And just uh, just to note that there is a real forest in Japan where people. Yeah. Is, is it? You said that they go there to commit suicide, or they have counselors there because so many people commit suicide. Yeah, both. Yeah, it's this. It's a very. Um, it's it's like the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. It's infamous um, for being a place where people. Um, might go and either consider it or or, or do that, and um, it it became such a uh, a frequent event 
um, that they have these forest workers who work there. Um, and their job is to basically counsel you if you need it, be there for you if you want, but not necessarily to deter you in any way from making that choice. I was really particularly struck when I was researching the, the forest that um, they have like these like hazard signs, almost like, you know, like we would have like stop signs or yield signs, but they have these signs there and they'll say like throughout the forest, like, please consult your bank, please consult your family, please like, so these actual kind of like warning signs, it's so like the forest is so known now that they actually have these kind of like this like bureaucracy almost around it. And that struck me as also being like, oddly darkly humorous too like that there's this effort to try to stop people from like what is one of the the most like personal choices that a human being could ever make and so like i don't know the, if it to me the place itself just had all of these like heightened emotions um and that becomes you know like often very compelling for an artist to kind of go there and, and look into it I think I heard you say in a Q&A, which just really struck me, that you would either research a fellow yeah. search and rescue workers, yeah. and that at the most beautiful part of any sort of area where they find bodies, I mean, that's I should say that's look. where they find the bodies, yeah. and, and you said something really No, compelling. I mean, it's, it's, it's the one thing that stayed with me the most when I was researching the forest, because they, they have, you know, people commit suicide in, in forests, not just in the Japanese forest. And I happen to know someone whose brother was a search and rescue person in a forest in Vancouver, in Canada. And he didn't like to talk about it. Um, but I told him what my intentions were and he was so gracious enough to give me his time and insight. And what he said to me, which is something that just stayed from the very beginning, which was that they always knew where to look for the bodies because inevitably it was in the most beautiful part of, of the forest, like a stream or a cliff. And I found that like, like the most human thing in the world that no matter what, even in our darkest times, like we still endeavor to find beauty, like even in that last moment that we're looking for beauty. I still get chills, like it's been like six years like talking about it. And I think that like, we're all trying like to do that, you, you know? Like I, I think that we're all trying to find something that makes life meaningful and count and some form of beauty. And um, I think that to me, it just was like a very full of pathos thing to hear this man describe that and the way that he also, and listening to how he described it as well, like he, he, he had this almost like banality towards death. Like he, he himself, because he had seen it, it, w it was regular. It's like when you talk to a doctor, or someone who has seen death, you know, that's part of life is death, you know. So we kind of romanticize it or are scared of it or feel this like great fear towards it. But, you know, for him it was like, this happens, we clean it up. <laughs> And again, like I think that like that's a very powerful sort of thing to investigate. And like for me, that kind of just I wanted to learn more about that that side of things and investigate that a little bit through these characters. How long did it take you to write the script for the People Garden? Yeah, it took me um, like on and off uh, six six years. I think from from the initial idea and developing it to. Uh, maybe five years to, to write to we started shooting, but then yeah, so okay. it's been like a, about a six-year process so, And that was the f not the first draft though. It sounds like did you you did revisions? Oh, time, yeah or, for or, uh -huh. revisions forever and always yeah, it's a funny thing like I again like I'm Canadian We have a particular system there and development is really really um, big in in our community so you know, there's multiple drafts over those years and there's input from producers and input from, you know, story editors and you go back and you rewrite. So, yeah. Right. Well, what I love about the film too is it's, it's not so heavy on dialogue. Yeah. It's really like it breathes. You feel what these characters are going through. You see it in the eyes. And um, did you tone back any of the writing? Was it yeah, overly definitely. wordy before? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I love writing dialogue. Um, so I, I will kind of go there, uh, which is probably 
I think an immature way to write. I'm not sure. I don't know. It depends on who you talk to. But so I, I, there was a lot of dialogue. Um, and then as you're kind of working on it and revising it, you're pulling back and trying to think of economy. And I think also because the film, I wanted to, it's a, to me, it's a romance film. People will say it's like a horror film or a thriller or what, but it's not. It's a romance film, really. Um, and, but it has this like mystery to it. So for me, I really wanted to like have this engagement with the audience of trying to figure out what is happening and the, le the less narrative structure that you can, not structure, but the less narrative information um, that, that you have, the more an audience can like activate their own sort of mind and start to try to figure things out. And I love that involvement. So, but it takes practice to get, to hone that and to bring it down to like, you know, the very simple, simple place of dialogue. And it also came from Dree because Dree is so great when she's, still and she's not you know i think you know i'm ch chatty <laughs> i don't know if you can tell that but so sweepy was like a little bit more chatty before but dree when you after i cast her you know you you start to move towards people's strengths and she's so good at just kind of being very still and having it be in her eyes so that became part of the character in the in the film as well yeah and pam as well like totally. the, especially the interactions between the two of them Absolutely. This sort of unspoken thing, and it's it's that it's dynamic really exciting is, to watch. is is yeah. was really fun to like film as well. And you're right, like just like that way that they look at each other becomes more telling than anything they could really say. Sure, sure, and and the smiles yeah. that were you know with a lot and of knowing. teeth showing. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. very interesting. I won't give too much away, but um, so in terms of uh, the dialogue, were there people that gave you feedback? Because I feel like it's the perfect amount. It's it's oh, just good. enough but it's, it doesn't sort of overly like, you know, it doesn't micromanage the, the viewer in right. terms of yeah. telling them too much. Yeah, for sure. I mean, again, like I think that the idea became that, the, that you wouldn't have as much of a backstory to that character, that there wouldn't be too much information about her, that you, you would lock in with her right off the bat and then and then just go on this journey with her and experience the forest exactly at the same time that she was experiencing it and that became like a really big part of like what i wanted the audience interaction to be was to to identify with her and not know anything more than she does for for the majority of the film until there's there's a certain point where i think the audience is ahead of her they sort of know what i think the audience knows what's going on and she might still not have figured it all out. And that becomes, I think, an emotional engagement where you, you've kind of bonded with this character and you're suddenly like, no, don't, like, you're, you're doing it wrong. You're going down the wrong path. You're, you're going about this the wrong way. And, and that becomes kind of dramatically interesting. So that's, that's what I wanted to play with, yeah. Right, okay, yeah, definitely. I, I, I do see that. And then you feel for her and then you're almost like this parent behind the scenes. Sure, like yeah. wanting to protect her. Absolutely. When you began writing, do you outline? Do you do a, you know, sort of the, the all the, yeah. you know, cookie cutter screenwriting uh, formatting that you're supposed to do? Or I, are you I, more tr I try now. Um, I, I, I think there's like two types of writers. They say it's like intuitive writer, and then well, someone made fun of me the other day because I couldn't remember what it was, and they said, well, that means that you're an intuitive writer. But it's like structured writer versus intuitive writer. So I'm an intuitive writer. That's first, like, so I, I have to force myself to write the outline um, because I would just like to actually start writing. That's how I work. I see things very visually. Um, I see it in my mind. I want to put it down on paper. That usually means it takes a little bit of time <laughs> to, to finish a script too because I think without that kind of like those natural steps of like outline, first draft, second draft and, and you know, there were all of those things, but I, I would write an outline so that I could send it to my producer and that he you know, would understand it. But for me, when my process, what works for me is, is to like just get in there and start writing. But I'm trying to be better. <laughs> I'm trying to be more, more um, disciplined in the way. Yeah, because I mean, especially like with, I'm writing like television as well right now and you, you know, you, it, it has to be more disciplined, so, but it's a process, like I'm still learning. 
mm. for sure. Well, I felt it flowed very naturally. So yeah. whatever you're doing, stick <laughs> That's with it. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Did you get funding uh, in the very beginning and then started honing the story or did you reach out to the actors first? How did that all work? So when I was in school, um, so I did like I did a degree, like a college degree and then after that I went to this place in Canada called the Canadian Film Center and it's like our version of the AFI basically. So I, I was writing it there as, as well, um, this script, and you're, they give you the means to like make a little short. So I made a little short about it as well that no one will ever see, hopefully ever. <laughs> it's terrible. Um, it's actually, it's all right. But um, so I, I, I did that. And then with that short, I approached um, a producer in, in Toronto that I was interested in, that I had actually worked with as an actress who was doing really, really interesting work. And then, uh, yeah, and then we went to um, the funders with our collective experiences, that short and an outline. And then they gave us a little bit of money to write the first draft. And then once we were in that, once we had the first draft, then we actually got like a little more substantial money um, for sort of each subsequent draft. So, yeah, I mean, Canada's really great that way because we have a government. Um, system set up to support the arts and if you can get into that system it's also like highly debated system by multiple filmmakers as you can understand who are living in Canada because you know if you don't get funding it you're sort of left out but if you end up being a part of that that system um, then you can you know you can you can make an okay living for I mean you are getting yeah they're they acknowledge that you know you have to take time off of your like teaching job or your you know your side projects or whatever to concentrate on the script. So there, there is that ability. Yeah. Progressive in yeah. many ways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, they do that in Europe as well. I mean, America is, is you know the, we're cap the capitalistic society here. Sure. So, and that you know that works a lot for film as well. So there's a lot of problems in the Canadian system, but but there is that kind of belief that there's like true value in culture in supporting you know arts. Did you write with uh, these various actors in mind, or was that did that come later? Yeah, that came much later. Um, I had I had some people in in mind um, writing it, and in a way, like I think that that would have been bad if I would have got those actors because I think that you you can only like. It becomes much more interesting then because you go from writing to directing and then it's a completely different set of like thinking and analytical skills and you know I think that the cast that I ended up with like really helped create and write the story with me in a way too because their personalities I, I re did some rewrites after I cast for sure oh okay yeah, before we started shooting and the J and the James Legro character the director I had just worked with him as an actress um, and we got along like a house on fire. He's amazing, and so I really wanted him to play that part. And he he's hilarious and wry and like grumpy kind of in a way that is like amazing. <laughs> and I was like, I'm just writing this character to like mm -hmm. suit you the most. And you know, luckily he he ended up doing it. But he was the only one that I kind of really wrote it. I did think about Pamela for Signe early on, too. I was like, there's no way we'll get her. So oh, okay. the fact that we actually yeah, it did is is pretty great. So, who was the first actor that you presented the script to, and how did it go? Yeah, I think um, I mean Dree was the first person that we that we cast, uh, Dree Hemingway, who plays Sweet Pea, and uh, that was obviously like the most important character in the film, and it, it, you kind of had to figure things out um, around whoever was going to be cast um, in that role. So, I had seen Starlet which is yes. this really great film that she did um, that she carries in, in so many ways. And you know, I was saying to you earlier that I didn't know after I saw Starlight if she was right for the role as I had written it. I didn't see it right away, but I loved her in that film. And I liked also like her, her persona, like outside of being an actress, she's kind of like this I don't know, like model, I guess, but she has this connection with like young girls and that's exactly who I wanted to, this film to kind of get to. So she stuck in the back of my head and then 
you know, it was like just like a classic, like our casting director mentioned her and she, they sent her the script and she called me. Um, yeah, she called me and she loved the script and she, she read for it and she was so natural and beautiful and like committed and um, just very like present which is really, really hard to do in an audition. So I just knew she was like an excellent actress that, you know, that Starlet wasn't a fluke. And it became really clear to me that like, she was exactly the right person for the role because, you know, she is so natural and subtle and she just has like so much that's just happening in her eyes. It's the kind of actress that I really love. And the world around her is a bit, I don't want to say surreal, but it's a little bit off kilter. And it's, you know, some of the characters around her are a bit like, arch and so having someone who's really grounded and like subtle for the audience to identify with I think is was the right choice and like it couldn't have worked out better I think she's so extraordinary and like raw in the film just like honest she's just very honest in the film right right and she and as she is in Starlet but you're right it's two different composites different, of totally of different, different characters life and situations yeah. and, and yeah for sure and in some of the smaller roles that she's had in in some bigger films like she's often quite kind of like funny and like, you know, goofy. And I think that's important for also a role like this, which is not like a funny role. <laughs> but you want there to be a lightness to it because it can't all be, it takes, you know, there's suicide in, 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 the, in the film. And, but it can't all be dark. It can't be so heavy that people are like, you know, overcome with, you know, sadness watching it. I didn't want to depress people watching it. You know, I wanted to make people feel, but... So she's right for that reason as well, because there's this kind of soulfulness, but she still kind of has a light touch, you know? Yeah, and that's what I was afraid when I first was going to watch it, that I would be, but I didn't feel it no. uh, throughout most of it. I felt fairly like it was. It was like a mystery, and yeah. there are parts that are, are, you know, especially to the interaction between uh, the two of the women in the film, and I'm curious, how did you cast Pam? Pamela Anderson. Yeah. I mean, like I said, that Pam did enter my mind when I was when I was uh, writing it, um, but I kind of said no. That's that's not going to happen. That's impossible. But um, we had a. I mean, first of all, she had done this interview on like the Ellen DeGeneres show. Um, she came out and she hadn't been interviewed for a while. She hadn't done something like, stuff for a while. She came out. She had cut all her hair off like sh really short and gamine and like she looked like she was a Godard girl like she just looked like she was not at all like um, the kind of persona that you would see seen and when she was talking on that film uh, on that show um, you know she she was very funny and very like self-deprecating and she was self-aware and I thought like the person who needs to play Signe has to be like very self-aware um, of that persona. So I started kind of like the wheels were turning. And then the casting director uh, that we had had been casting a Werner Herzog film that she was supposed to be in, which again, like you wouldn't think Werner Herzog and Pamela Anderson, but apparently it was like very close to happening and then it just like things do fell apart and she was looking for a script and they sent it to her and again she called she called me from Malibu I got this like phone call I was like in nice. Toronto in my bedroom and this call from and it was Pam we talked for an hour and a half she was so easy to talk to she really understood the character she really understood you know what I was trying to do with the relationship between those two women and how they're kind of they're versions of the same character in a way like in a way I feel like Sweet Pea could have gone on in her life had she stayed with Jamie to be a Signe in a way because in my mind like I have a backstory for Sweet Pea although it's not really kind of talked about in, in the film as much but um, to me I just felt like there was like this connection that those two women had because they recognized themselves in each other even though that they were enemies she got that right away she knows so much about art she knows so much about film you know, so you can talk to somebody, you can talk about references. We had some like amazing conversations about Fellini women and, and all, you know, all these things. And, and she's, she's really the coolest. She's like absolutely the coolest. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of just kind of like the Marilyn Monroe stereotype. But yeah. then when you would read exactly. things that she would say, you, you know, it just, it just shows that that was the one image that was presented, but it didn't mean that that was the full package. And, and Absolutely. it definitely shows. Yeah, and I think she really actually uses like Marilyn Monroe as like 
kind of a, like I, I know she really you know respects her and, and um, respects that that you know car career that Marilyn you know had and the fact that there was it was almost like acting like that persona is very much a persona and Pam is very aware of of that and she can play with that and go in and out of it it's very fascinating yeah that's mm. really interesting mm. I think you said something I'd like it to just be seen as a filmmaker yeah. not like it's different or special and and I, I realize that there is a lot of pressure in an interviewer asking the the woman question you yeah know? Um, and maybe just you can just touch on that just just how it's just yeah so that's not different or special or whatever it's just a filmmaker yeah, I mean, I think what I meant by that, too, was that often in interviews, like a lot of my colleagues who are men and at the same kind of level as I am, you know, just with their first or second film, they get asked about their process, you know, as you're asking, right. they get asked about their films, they, their film gets interpreted and watched with a critical eye, um, that, but when you're a female filmmaker, they want to know what it's like being a female making films, and I think that's part of the problem, because I think that like we can't be taken at the same uh, level as our, our male colleagues until there is some sort of sense of, um, you know, that the choices that we're making, like I, you know, just as an aside, I read a review of this film and the guy said, it, you know, that it was, you know, pretty. And I was like, you know, it, oh. it's a visual medium. That's um, it? So it's Just going pretty? to, but like, you know, but that was his kind of like one thing. And I was like, no, if it was a male who had done like a visually interesting or compelling thing, you would have said something more. You would have mentioned the cinematographer's name. You would have mentioned the production designer's name maybe. Or, or But for, and I felt, I mean, I might be wrong, but it felt gendered. Like it felt as though it was dismissive. Like, of course, a girl is going to make us a pretty film, you know, but that's like not thoughtful. So for me, it's like, on the one hand, like I'm a very... Uh, strong a feminist and on a very unapologetic about it and unspoke uh, outspoken and but not I mean no buts that's a full stop but <laughs> 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 but um, it would be great to get to a point I'm sure for all female filmmakers where we can just be asked about you know the work right. No, I get it and I know <laughs> journalists play a part in that and, and I, I oh yeah I, but I, I totally to understand I mean later. Mm -hmm. I, I respect the fact when you know journalists are asking you about you know the female question because it's been untalked about for so long. You know, diversity is now something that we're we're able to talk about and have a dialogue with, and it is great. So it's great to be asked about that way. I just like it to be also like followed up with some questions about the actual um, like the piece itself. You know. Well, the film is clearly more than just pretty. I mean, there's a, a deeper uh, message in it. And um, I think I heard you touch on it a little bit and just how talking about happiness and, and what we go after, is it really fulfilling or mm. just the title of it seems good? Yeah. And so I think you touched on that as well as it being a romance and then the dynamics that happen within a romance. So yeah, uh, yeah, there's there's more to it than just the visuals. So. Cool, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Even though, and also to I the- I mean, it is, yeah, the visuals are, are, are a huge part of the storytelling, you know, as well. So I don't mind if people, like, respond um, at all, you know, to that. But obviously pretty is just kind of a little bit dismissive to the work that went into it. Oh, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I, and, and there is one scene that is very beautiful, and that is the one where Pam Anderson is, like, flying. Oh, yeah. her, her role in the film is this model that comes into this relationship. And totally. We'll just, keep it there but the the rain coming down and I think you had mentioned that you really love that scene I do yeah yeah I, lo I love that scene um, there's a lot I mean there's 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 a few scenes we got right but that's a very visual scene for sure I, I think it's very really, um, you know also it goes back to this idea of like beauty and that we as human beings endeavor to find beauty so in one kind of hand I think there's a little bit of critique in the film to what what we go after and how we try to um, find our happiness or how we try to find our beauty um, and what we're willing to kind of not see in order to find that happiness and I think that the music video shoot within that and, and Pamela's role is like you know those filmmakers are presented in the film um, as being you know callous I think and and unthoughtful and they are, you know, I think that they know more that they could be telling Sweet Pea and they're, and they're not, and they're kind of dismissive of the fact that a human being has gone missing, 
you know, on the other hand, they're trying to create something that they find kind of, and you, it's undeniable that when that music video is being shot and she's up in the air, that that is an image of beauty and that there's validity to that. So it's like playing with those two sort of ideas of, you know, the kind of the lies that we tell ourselves and the, the sort of facades that we create and the beauty that we focus on, you know, versus what's underneath and the kind of how you need both. You, you really need, you need to find the balance of those kinds of things in, in life. So, yeah. Wow. I like that. Um, did you have an agent or manager before you um, made the film or, or did that come later? Uh, I don't actually have an, a manager, an agent, oh, even wow. now. Um, did all this I'm taking that? meetings. Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, like I, I made this film in, in Canada and outside of the American system. And like, you know, we obviously have Americans in the film and we had an American casting director. Um, but uh, in Canada, it's not as maybe necessary to have an agent or I don't know, just didn't feel didn't I, I already had my producer and I had an agent for acting. Um, but but now it's like, yeah, there's um, I'll, I'll get one one of these days. I I just am very selective. <laughs> no, I, About, I, yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah. I was watching um, a film on screenwriting the other day and this guy was talking about when he's really in it with his writing and he's just, I mean, he's creating these incredible worlds, everything else around him falls apart. Yeah. And I think <laughs> anybody who's creative can probably relate to that. Is there anything you can touch on with that? I think you just become so immersed in it that like, I wouldn't say that things like fell apart around me, but I would say that you are negligent towards like, you know, f friends and and family because you're just in that world you're so it takes as you know like so much to get a film off the ground and once you're in it and so you you know there you definitely uh, that sort of life work balance doesn't always work for the duration but I've also kind of been in the industry for a while so that I know how to manage that and my friends you know know my family know that just like everything's gonna be shut off for a while and I'll come back to you and I'll make it up to you. <laughs> right. Yep. And so the screening is in LA uh, tonight? Yeah. There's, okay. um, it's playing at the Downtown Independent tonight in LA and for the next week and it's playing uh, across the states in uh, select cities, small release, small film, but uh, and then online. Um, so it's available on American iTunes starting now as well. Oh, um, great. Yeah, so okay. people can, if you get a chance to see it in the, it's better on a bigger screen because of some of the, that imagery that's in there, but obviously, but um, it's just as good getting curled up and watching it in your, in your home. So I think you said earlier it was six years that it, it kind of took to, to really come to fruition, hmm. but can you take a step by step in terms of um, putting the words on the paper to being in production where you're in the forest and you're shooting and yeah I mean that's a law a long time to cover <laughs> so I probably can't do it step by step but you know for the first year it's a lot of research and just testing out writing um, like I said this was the first thing that I, I wrote as a full um, as a full film so uh, you know you're learning also how to screen write in a way in a way as you're writing it um, so there is, you know, we had a story editor um, on about maybe a year after I started writing. So that's when it became a, a lot more structured in terms of like delivering drafts or delivering rewrites. So I think that we would like probably every two weeks or something have a, have a meeting, um, maybe every month uh, where we were uh, giving notes like my producer who I worked with um, on this and I had made a short with before his name is Dan Beckerman um, and he really like shepherded this film right from the beginning and I trust him and his taste and he um, he just did this really huge movie called The Witch I don't know if you had seen it but it's like this really huge kind of artistic horror film so he's he's certainly on the rise but this was a smaller film um, of his and so he would you know come over to my house you know, with the story editor and we'd sit around and drink coffee and go through the notes and, and hash it out. And then, um, and then we'd have to go away and work to make a living and do other kind of jobs uh, a little bit as well. And then, 
Um, then we'd come back to it. And I'd say like that sort of happened for I would maybe like four years. And then you start the application process for like, then you have a script that is ready. Oh, I know one other thing that happened was, which was really important for making this film was that I did um, this lab at, at TIFF at the Toronto uh, International Film Festival had a screenwriting uh, screenwriting lab, like it's similar to how like Sundance is, but it was the inaugural year. And I had applied with this script and um, it was a workshop with like another, yet another story editor. Um, mine was from like Sweden. We would Skype. It was like this very kind of interesting experience where she was completely out of kind of the, the, the group of screenwriters and writers and filmmakers that I was used to. So she was a totally fresh eyes on this project. And that script uh, won, like my script won the audience award for that. So it was awarded something and then we kind of fast tracked to um, production. So that's when we um, were able to approach the Canadian um, funding bodies and ask for money for, for making the film. And it, that's a very long process. I don't know if it's boring or not, but it's, it, you know, there were a lot of, in putting all the financing together for this film, um, it was it was really tricky. It was just really really tricky because of the budget level and because of certain kind of funding that we got. Because there's, there's different funding agencies in Canada, so we actually had to shoot some of it in a certain geographical location in Canada. So all the interiors are done in Ontario, and the exteriors are Japan and, and BC. Oh, okay. So that's like, that would be like the equivalent of like doing only interiors in New York and exteriors in LA or something. I mean, it's like that far apart between like Sudbury, Ontario and, and BC and then obviously Japan. So yeah, the, and then like the, you know, the lead up to actually like the day of shooting, there was like three intense months of prep, six months of, of soft prep like location uh, uh, scouting and everything. I mean, that was like a, that's a blur. <laughs> like that's, it was so intense during those, those final three months that we were all getting sick and we were all like, it was like, but it was, but it was amazing. It's thrilling because you know what's going to happen. And then just that like first day of, of, of shooting, I remember, I remember that super vividly. And the shoot itself was over the course of about a month and a half uh, with a break in the middle, which is also unusual, but that was part of it because of the Japan portion. And so, yeah, three different crews based on the different regions other than the keys, like the cinematographer is obviously the same and production designer, but um, all the like different gaffer, different. So it's all that kind of like learning curve as well with each new crew and. Wow. It's a lot. And this is a first yeah. feature that you're doing. I mean, yeah. that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just, I mean, I think that's part of like, the, you know, it took so long because we knew we had to do it at a certain budget. And it's still incredibly low budget compared to what is out there. Like, we're at like $1.2 million, but they're not, they don't give that to you just for kind of nothing. So you really have to be prepared and ready to go. And, um, when it all happened. So yeah, it was, it was a huge learning curve. I mean, yeah, it was it was uh, very challenging, but very thrilling. I think if you're in, in film, you probably love problem solving. You probably have that kind of mind. And I, I do, like it feels creative to me to like be given a challenge or an obstacle and just be like, I got this, I can do this analytical thinking towards figuring it out. And you just do, you just put the pieces of the puzzle together, so. So 1.2 million Canadian dollars. Yeah. Is <laughs> Which is what, like four dollars American? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know what it, that worked out to, but yeah. And so I would imagine so many of the steps along the way, it was where you were either revising something and then coming back to show them in order to. That, yeah, that's, I that mean, the funny thing is, um, th the funding agencies were pretty hands off. I've heard other stories, but they were pretty hands off with us in terms of content they just wanted to see the drafts and know that we were continuing along and in terms of like creative input they didn't give a ton of that so we were kind of like really really lucky um i haven't heard that as being necessarily the case for you know other other people um but again because it's like a government funding they're not really necessarily creatives that are funding it always they're it's a bureaucracy it's like it's a 
we're it's a self like country that finances art so they're you know making sure that you're getting your drafts in on time and that kind of bureaucracy but they're not necessarily like commenting on the content like they might a little bit but it it's not hard and fast yeah so they're not saying you know what can we make sweet pea more this likable right, and all right. of that yeah <laughs> well i mean but that's still like there was a lot of input on the script process like all along the way um regardless of the funding agencies because you're just showing it to other people and you're just or you're sending it to you know like the like the the screenwriting lab or you know we sent it to a tribeca lab and you know early on in the process too so people are giving feedback in that sense and yeah there's definitely i have stories of like that make you know sweet pea more likable and you know sexy and or i don't know anything but <laughs> yeah you just have to kind of know what your um know what the story is you're you're telling and try to stay as flexible and open to other people's thoughts but then ultimately like know the best decision to be made for the film that you're trying to make because that's why they're giving you the money is to hear your point of view you know right so did you do a script read with everyone uh not with this cast no. no i did multiple script script reads along the way with like friends just to hear it out loud but no there was no like we uh <laughs> I think like Ma the guy who played the gentleman who plays Mac, his name is Jay West. I think he's incredible in the film. Finding him was like the hardest thing. I think we found him like just in the nick of time. It was very hard to find someone who was Japanese, English speaking, Canadian, but so he was living <laughs> in Tokyo and and but also but also good, you know. And yeah, he is so I think strong in this film. And so yeah, we you know we were casting some of the other parts like up until the last minute and. Then everyone showed up and we were shooting. Yeah, there was no no cast read, no wow. rehearsal. So, and how did that that first day? You know that you have this incredible budget, albeit small by sure, Hollywood yeah, standards, yeah. but still, Big for us, most yeah. filmmakers would totally yeah, I know, just I know, yeah, salivate over that. Yeah, and for sure. How was that first day? You've got the people that you you didn't think you'd get Pam Anderson, but you yeah. got her and. There and I mean, it's an incredible feeling. I'm not gonna, it's like the greatest. It doesn't, like, I, I'll be on my deathbed thinking of like that, that how good that all felt to have it come together and to visualize things. I think one of the reasons too, just going back to something you, you mentioned that scene where um, Pamela's like in the air, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't have necessarily so much to do with the story, but I think one of the things about that scene was like, like so many of the other scenes, but that was also something like I just had visualized it in my head for so long, and then it's literally there. And you know, there was there was a lot of scenes like that where it's like it's been in your mind for so long, and then it's you know, Catherine did a great job of shooting it, um, Catherine Lutz, and you know, production designer Zosha McKenzie, and everyone kind of makes that thing that's in your head real, and those actors come together. And they're all there and it's you know Dree looks exactly how you wanted her to look she's like she's present in a way that is like just it feels so good to see that and that's the reward for all that you know six years of everything and that's the reward for like you know being unemployed and just struggling for money and that's the reward for bad reviews and that's the reward for everything it's just like that time shooting when you actually get to like make what is in your head real that's no one gets that's amazing <laughs> like that's that's an incredible feeling that i think we all chase you know what genre would you consider the people garden you said it's a romance yeah, it's, but then there's a thriller aspect it's to it. like genre less and that's kind of the point a little bit for me like i, I don't know I, i'm when people talk about diversity and plur plurality in storytelling right now because they're talking about it in terms of gender and race and you know, sexual preference, and and um, I think it's um, I think that that is only because we are craving new forms of storytelling because we are a little bit the the classical narrative, male-driven heroic Hollywood narrative stories are 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 played out. There, there's only so much of that that we can that we can take, and so I think I'm like playing with genre like i'm almost using it as a way of like what she's going through uh, which f like it's not nothing new i'm not breaking any ground in that way to kind of have a multi-genre film but like um you know some people will really embrace that and get that and love it and some people kind of won't but yeah i mean for me it's like 
you know, there's mystery elements, it's a romance, you know, it's darkly humorous. Yeah. It's dark, it's um, also light, it's hopeful. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. know, it's, it's, it's life. It's like there's, you know, there's a lot of what you experience just in life. Did anybody try to push you away from the suicide aspect? Because it's not like mm -hmm. a suicide heavy film right. where you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be so depressed. But you don't feel that. But, but did, did anybody try to say, hey, you know, can you just try it where she goes there for something else and it's not that area? <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, n like, no. I mean, I think, um, not that I can necessarily recall. I mean, I'm sure that there were people that didn't, um, like I'm sure there are people that we approached for either funding or some other kind of support that, you know, wanted to stay away from it. But no, I think that, again, I hate to keep going back to the fact that it was made in Canada, but there, like I have a little bit more, people know who I am because of acting and they know my sensibilities. And I, and I think like the script, it read even from, from those early drafts as having a kind of like a, a lightness to it and that it wasn't just like this heavy, right. um, you know, suicide um, film. So right. Ordinary what, People or something like that. Yeah, right. it was, well, yeah. I mean, but that, I mean, that's a great, that's oh, also, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's a fantastic fi film. And there's been, you know, there's been, there's, there was a, f yeah, anyways, but yeah, th there's, um, yeah, I think like you said, it's just not like it's not a suicide right. film. No, it's, it's not. It's in there, obviously, but um, but it's not a central. It's it's. I mean, I'm not it is, commenting it, yeah. on it. Like right, I'm not. Sure, you know sure. what I mean? Like yeah. I think there's like kind of a, a difference then. Like I think that had I set out to sort of answer it, answer suicide, or, you know, make that the topic of conversation, then we'd be ha like it would have been a different film. But for me, it was just more about this young woman needing to face something in her life that she was like ill prepared to, to face even though she thought she could do it mm. you know she's about her becoming more vulnerable in a way like not you know we see all these movies these days where the females are coming stronger and stronger and stronger and in a way it's like the reverse in this one like she's kind of she goes there to you know break up with him I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do this thing and then she she kind of doesn't her plans don't go her way and she has to kind of face some things that she hadn't been willing to face before yeah, that's interesting. You're right. It is a reverse. What's your typical day like when you're in production or, or the writing phase? What's your typical day? Well, writing, I think, is, is very different than being in the production side of it. Writing, I like to do a 9 to 5, uh, like usually 11 to 8. Like I'm not, I, I like to structure my days so that I'm writing it like a office job which is kind of funny in a way because you kind of do this job because you don't like <laughs> the office job but I like that kind of structure because I like to be able to have an endpoint for relaxation it doesn't always work that way um, but like relaxation meaning like watching movies or just like thinking about something else other than the project because I think that's so important just to stay like in life <laughs> as well um, so yeah I'll get up and and I'll you know, sit in front of my computer, not writing <laughs> for a couple of hours, then write something, maybe, then go make some lunch and come back and not write something for a while and then go back, you know, and then you just kind of start and stop like any job and just do that consistently though, f you know, five days a week for sure. And in production, pff, no, like just nothing, just like no sleep, no, no, no emails, no Twitter, no, like nothing other than just the total immersion in, in the project. There's just literally no, I mean, maybe down the line if there's multiple zeros added to budgets and you have, you know, help, maybe there's, it's possible to kind of have like a life. I've heard these like stories that like Lars von Trier like ends at four and they all have dinner and everything and that sounds lovely, but I can't picture it. Because <laughs> sure. there's always uh -huh. problems to be solving or, you know, there's always, you know, you're just just in it for, for, for production. I think you're just completely in that world and only in that world. Do you want to do something similar as your next project? Or right now you can't even think about that because... No, I'm back at it. I, I'm like, no, oh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm back at it. Oh, wow. Uh, I had a, like a break after I was finished and finished the edit. It was a very long edit as well. And uh, I had a break, so that was good. But no, you, I, I 
I love what I do. So I'm back at it. I'm doing television. I uh, I have a series that um, that the like the script was optioned just recently in in um, that I'm making with some friends in Canada. So we'll see if that gets um, picked up. But that's kind of taking up my time right now. And I also am writing another feature and. I have another idea for a television series, so it kind of does, and right. I'm reading scripts as well because I, I also love directing other people's work. I find that super fulfilling. So no, it's it's back back in the immersion. Do you see a lot of differences in Canadian TV versus uh, the U.S.? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm but TV now can be like the TV in Canada. I think that we're aiming for is the stuff where like Netflix or someone like that also might be a part of it and they're doing a little bit more co-productions with Canada which is really helpful um, but yeah I mean you guys like America ha I mean you guys I'm here now too but um, America has like some excellent I think television don't you think like I think it's all of the HBO and the show Showtime Hulu, like all of those shows are incredible. They're all like they're the independent cinema for me. Like the, that's where it's getting really kind of interesting and gritty and um, like you know, chancy. Like not necessarily the network. I mean, I think there's some interesting things in U.S. network television, but all of those ones that you watch on your computer are really up there. And I think Canada's like a little bit behind, you know. Really? But, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh mm -hmm. yeah. But there. But you know. We're gonna we're gonna make sure they catch up. Okay, that's <laughs> yeah, <good. laughs> yeah, we're we're trying. Yeah, Nadia, for someone that has a script, a feature length uh, film script that they're done with, then what's your advice? Mm. Where, where where do they go with it? Um, whether they're in the states, whether they're in Canada, I know it's or Europe. A bit different. There's yeah, a yeah. Lot of differences. That's a tough one. A little bit. Um, I think you have to have. I think you have to find a collaborator, a producer type figure that is a creative producer. Meaning someone who is going to be able to understand your vision for the work and that is gonna take it to the right people. Um, and so that would be my main advice. Like I, I don't necessarily know like how you get things made, I don't, you know, but we're all figuring that out. But having that one backer that's gonna speak for you because I think that like as screenwriters or, or directors, we sometimes have a hard time putting ourselves out there, but you need that one producer that understands you, supportive of you, and is going to connect you to the people that can, you know, pay for it and, and or who are going to support it. So that would be my my advice is to try to find that that creative partner on on the journey that you're about to take. 